everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, this presentation is totally brand new for this uh, conference, never seen before. So that may, may mean that it's totally awesome and groundbreaking. You can say you were here when you saw this revolution, or it may mean that it just doesn't make any sense. But uh, hopefully it will be uh, the former. So um, by trade, I'm a pay-per-click advertise, advertising expert like, uh, like Jeff at Fang. And um, I have these experiences all the time where people want to talk to me about the long tail. And I'll give you an example. We have a client that is, um, I can't, I'm not allowed to say the name of the, the client. I wish I could. But let's just say they're one of the top five internet companies in the world. And we run their PPC for them. And when, I, when we started working on their campaign, um, we looked at their account, and they had 250 million keywords in their account. And what they had done is they had basically gone to a series of yellow pages and white pages and information guides and just uploaded every single word they could possibly find. Um, and when we looked at the actual uh, uh, percentage of keywords that were getting any clicks at all, it was probably a million. And we looked at the keywords that made up maybe 95% of their revenue, it was probably 40 or 50,000. And this is an extreme example of a client that probably you can make an argument does have a need for a lot of the keywords. But the, the idea that they thought that they were going to have clicks on 250 million keywords, and I subsequently heard about a travel company that allegedly has 500 million keywords, um, was sort of struck, it struck me that there's this um, almost a fairy tale about how powerful the long tail is. So what I wanted to do was just talk about what the long tail is, and then what, what a trend that I see emerging, which is sort of, you could say, a divergence from the long tail called the wide tail. Um, so let's start by saying, what is the long tail? Um, the long tail is, is, is best described in the world of e-commerce. So we all remember in the pre-internet days, you went to your local bookstore, and the average bookstore has about 10,000 books. Then the chains came along, they have, I guess, 200,000. And now you go to Amazon, there's 1.8 million books is, was, is the best data I could find. So the notion, and I'm taking this from the best source on the internet, Wikipedia, is um, that it's this notion that, that you're selling a large item, number of a unique items. So rather than having um, you know, five books that make up all of your sales, you have 500,000 books that get one sale each. And I did an, a search on um, Amazon. I did a search for a lemon cookbook, and, I, and you can see I, I used their taxonomy or the breadcrumbs. I went from books, and then I did cookbooks, then I, food and wine, then I did vegetar vegetables, vegetarian, then I did healthy diet cooking, then I did lemon, and I got 1,000 books that were in all of these subcategories that were somehow about lemon. So pretty amazing. So this long tail certainly exists on the internet, and, and this is what we're all experiencing as we surf online in shopping. What I'm most familiar about with is the search world. And so um, we, we typically talk about the head and the tail in search. So the head would be a word like mortgage, very generic. The tail would be something like San Mateo, mortgage rates for good credit, um, super jumbo. And, and this is why the, the, the notion that the reason that so many advertisers are in, enthralled by the long tail is because they feel like if I can just be the only person to buy that San Mateo good credit super jumbo loan keyword, I'm going to get a highly qualified user because you can't get much more qualified than someone telling you exactly what they're looking for. And hopefully no one else will have thought about that keyword to buy and I'll get it for a penny. Huge win. Um, that's the, the concept behind the long tail in search. We're also seeing especially through user-generated content, huge tons of data coming online. Going back to Jeff's presentation about big data, um, I, I couldn't find, I didn't really find, do the research to find the exact statistic, but someone says, there's been all these statistics that there's more data being uploaded online today in one day than the entire first, whatever, 20,000 years of human existence. And we're seeing this, this is an example from, from YouTube, where just in the course of six years, um, the amount of data being uh, uploaded to YouTube has gone up 10x. 
We can also see this just in general with user-generated content where, and this goes back to, well, there you go. It's uh, now we have two zettabytes of information shared in 2011. I don't know what a zettabyte is. Maybe someone here is more scientific that does. Um, I know what a terabyte is, and I, that was something I didn't know about a year ago. Um, but we're seeing this incredible, incredible massive amount of content being driven on, being sent online. And this is what it feels like, I think, if you really try to sort of understand it, you really try to absorb it. Uh, you, you can't possibly go to YouTube and see more than one, one millionth of a percent of the data that's available on, on YouTube. Um, that said, it is great. I mean, I was, uh, I'll, I, to give you an example, I was suddenly got on an Elliott Smith kick um, about um, two weeks ago, and my friends asked me if I was suicidal. Um, if you know who Elliott Smith is, and I'm not, but, or I'm not from Portland either, but, um, uh, I just was totally into Elliott Smith, and I started type, type searching for Elliott Smith videos on YouTube. And you can get these videos, like, live. You can get almost every concert he was ever in, I think, live. It's fantastic. I love it. Um, and that's the beauty of the long tail, but it's also sort of a very frustrating experience. Um, so, so as I thought about this, I thought, well, there's kind of three groups that are imp impacted by this long tail. First and foremost, there's us as consumers. Um, secondly, there are the publishers who are trying to... Um, handle and profit from the long tail. And third, there are the marketers, which I consider myself a, a consumer and a marketer. I'm in between. What do I do about this long tail? So for consumers, I think it's a good news, bad news situation. The good news is you have a cornucopia of information that you can access online. The bad news is it's mind-blowing, and it's, it can be overwhelming. For publishers, the good news is there's just a lot more data that you can, I mean, if you want to be um, capitalist about it, that you can monetize. Um, you know, how great is it that you can be um, the Bleacher Report and get, if anyone, if people are familiar with that, and get hundreds of thousands of people to write for you for either for free or for pennies on the dollar. The bad news is it's, it's how do you organize this data? So I, what I, I was just curious. I looked at, I was trying to get a site map of Amazon. And I, maybe a site map exists. Maybe Ian knows because he's more of an SEO guy than I am. I couldn't find it. What I did find at the bottom was this kind of, you can't really see it here, but it's, I guess it's kind of a site map. And what, it does, what you can see here is these are all their stores. I had, re, I, I had no idea how many stores they had purchased. They have 6PM to Zappos to Abe Books to um, Diapers.com to Casa.com, um, ShopBop, et cetera. Just trying to or for just tr trying to get Amazon to organize all of their their different units and properties is overwhelming, um, so it's very challenging. Now, for marketers, I, I would argue that the long tail has, has largely been uh, a, a boon. Uh, I can't really complain about the long tail. Yes, it is more complex, but to my to my earlier point, the ability to to serve an ad to someone who has very clearly indicated a very high level of intent um, in search or has watched a video specifically related to my product, or has read an article, uh, you know, I have no complaints about it. It's great. Um, the problem is um, that actually accessing the long tail as a marketer is becoming harder and harder. And it's not because of the amount of time that's required to, to, um, to access it or to figure out the technology. It's actually because, in a lot of ways, both consumers and publishers are sort of moving away from long tail behavior. And that's where the wide tail, I think, comes in. So, so that's what I want to really talk about today, which is this concept of the wide tail. Um, so I came up with a definition, which is, which is threefold. Uh, and this is a work in progress. So again, don't shoot me if it doesn't f fully make sense. But the first concept is that the wide tail, rather than going deep, going an inch wide at, at a mile deep, consumers are going a mile wide on an inch deep. So People are, are deriving partial value from many sources and many devices, rather than um, very deep value from one source and one device. Um, the easiest example, well, I'll show an example of this in a second. The second theme of the wide tail is the destruction of the long tail. And that is that publishers are trying to come up with mechanisms to push consumers away from do, doing long, from long tail behavior. And I'm going to go into a great deal of detail on that. And the third one is, I guess, going back to sort of the big data concept, which is that publishers are trying to derive simple answers from complex data. 
So the long tail is very complex, and publishers would prefer that that they give you, they figure out your answer and try to give it to you rather than having you do all this deep research. So at, at its core, though, the, what, what the wide tail is is really about consumer choice. Um, the internet is becoming more ubiqu ubiquitous in our lives, and consumers now have, um, through devices and different channels, just a ton of different places to to access information and content and and um, to engage online. So here's here's how it looks. Um, this is some data. I just did this yesterday, last night actually, on Google Trends, Google.com forward slash Trends. You can do get, if you haven't used it, it's pretty cool. You can get all sorts of data on what is what sort of searches are trending on the internet. Now this is a little bit. Um, a little bit inaccurate because this is a, these are Google searches, and uh, the number of people typing in Google on Google is a little bit of a misnomer. Although it was one, it, I know it was once the case. I don't think it is anymore that the number one search on Google was actually Google, um, which which maybe as if you're a marketer may be uh, indicative of how much you have to sometimes explain pe things to people on the internet and um, not over, not assume that your your audience is in incredibly smart or or not smart. Um, but, but what you can see here is over just from 2006 to the present, I guess it's 2004 to the present, how much um, in 2004 you really had Google and Yahoo were the only sort of properties people were searching for. This, um, I think it's a, I guess it's a purple line. I'm actually, I'm colorblind, so I don't know. If, I think that's blue, actually, the big line there. And purple's on the bottom. It's Facebook. You can see how that's taken off. But in essence, you know, you've seen a great divergence in the type of, big publishers that consumers are relying on and are interested in. The same is true for devices. And I, I think anyone who is, unless you've been hiding um, under a rock, you know that um, we, are, we are no longer a desktop um, society. So I see lots of people. I see a tablet. I see a mobile phone. I see someone with a tablet and a mobile phone. And I'm sure there's someone here with a tablet, a mobile phone, and a, and a laptop. And if there was a a way to plug in a desktop, someone would probably have brought that too, right? Um, so we're seeing this great diversity. And this is, a, by the way, this is a huge challenge for marketers. Um, I think um, Mel mentioned uh, Avinash um, Koshik from, um, from Google. And he has this great concept of, of um, talking about attribution, which is attribution is trying to connect the dots between how people are surf surfing um, um, the internet. And he says that there's now there's intra-channel attribution, so it does one, one search engine influ search keyword introduce influence another search keyword to drive a conversion. There's intra-device attribution. How does someone surfing on a mobile um, a, a device influence a purchase on a, a laptop? And, there's, and then there's offline or online attribution. How does someone who's surfing online end up buy something in a store? How does that influence purchase? So we're seeing this huge diversity of how people are, are accessing um, data through devices. And then this is even more confusing. And this, to me, looks like it was something out of Star Trek. And, and unfortunately, you're, you're not going to be able to sort of see this unless you download the, the actual um, URL. But what this is is this concept that, has there, have everyone heard of the Internet of Things? Has everyone heard of that, this concept? It's this new ch concept that basically the Internet is being integrated into our everyday life. So we have like, I think there's something, the Internet of Pets. You know, how is the Internet going to impact our ability to, to monitor where our pets are? There's the trackable devices, uh, Fitbit and Jawbone. There's um, Google self-driving cars and Google Glass and everything. So not only do we have these devices that we're familiar with now, um, in five or ten years, we're going to have all sorts of devices. We have There's already you know, internet-enabled refrigerators, and uh, TVs are going to be internet-enabled, and your cars should be internet-enabled. So again, we're, we're, we're exploring um, the internet now from, from many, many different devices, and it's only going to get more complex. Of course, we also have, just if you look at social networks, um, what I would argue is that people, the way that people are using social networks has gone from a very deep usage of, let's say, Facebook or a deep usage of Twitter to disparate usage across many, many networks. And for those of you who are gamers, the same is also true. Um, if you think back to, let's say, 1994, which was the last time that I could sort of call myself a gamer, um, we had Sega and Nintendo and I don't know, was Xbox around in 1994? I don't think it was. No? Sega and Nintendo then. And, you know, p people would buy lots of titles on Sega and Nintendo. Now you have 
um, tied, now you have gaming companies that are spreading across the internet different, um, in different categories and um, different devices, et cetera. It's become very wide in its approach. So how does this manifest itself? And I think um, as consumers, I think we can all sort of relate to this. Um, I would say eight years ago, uh, 2005, if you were doing a search for shoes, if you were looking to buy shoes, you might start out with Google on your computer and you type in shoes. And you'd find some ad, you'd read about it, you'd say, oh, well, actually, you know what, I, I actually want a Prada shoe, so those look good. And then you'd go a little deeper and you'd end up with Prada three-inch pumps made in Italy. Um, today, what you might do is you might start out on your tablet and on Pinterest and look at some pictures of some really cute shoes. You might then go to YouTube and watch a video about the best Prada shoes out there. And then eventually you might do the same search, but you're going to do it on your, your tablet. Um, so again, what's happened here is you've gone from one search on one device on Google to a multi-factor, multi-device search. Um, and in a way, it's it, this, this notion of sort of getting really deep on Google is not as valuable anymore because it's really being everywhere. If, you want, if you're a Prada manufacturer, you can't just put your effort into that 9,999th keyword on Google. You have to be everywhere across the internet. You have to go wide. So how does this work for marketers? And this is what I'm most familiar with. Most of what you see up here um, are actually examples of Google products that you can advertise on. So um, there's, there's AdWords, there's remarketing, there's YouTube, there's Google Display Network, there's Google retargeting lists, there's Google product listing ads, there's Google extensions. But then you also have Facebook, and you have uh, Yahoo, and Yahoo's pro par partnership with Inadco, and Native Ads, and Twitter, and Facebook um, earned. And you have multiple devices, you have attribution, et cetera. So as a marketer, my argument is it's very difficult to, to just put all your eggs in the search basket and go for that 10,000th keyword. You have to invest across many, many channels. Um, you, don't really, you can't really go deep anymore. You have to go wide. And this is kind of a, a, an even more confusing sort of picture where now we're trying, as marketers, we're trying to tie all this together use all this technology, and I think I have the next slide. Yes, this is this wonderful chart that just came out um, this week from Luma Partners, um, LumaScape. Um, these are called LumaScapes. If you haven't seen them, they're pretty interesting. But this is the universe of marketing technology that us marketers are supposed to sort of pay attention to. Um, again, if you think that you can actually go long tail on any of this, um, you're, you're going to be at, at a loss. Um, as a digital agency, we started out as a search engine marketing company. We now offer uh, four different channels, and that's because that's what customers are asking for, because you have to be everywhere. And this is a chart that shows how spend over time has diversified. If you look at um, 2009, mobile marketing was only 400 million. It's projected at 2014 at 1.2 billion. I think that's actually probably low. This is old data. Um, and you can see that the, the spend starting to diversify as well. Search engine marketing, thankfully for my business, is still the biggest um, piece of the pie. But um, certainly a lot of diversification. So what's really interesting here is how are publishers reacting to this? So what, I, what I've hopefully shown you guys is that consumers are, 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 are spreading, it, spreading their wings and doing a little bit on a lot of channels rather than a lot on a few channels. As marketers, we have to do this. We have to follow the consumers. It's their only choice. I would argue that publishers, what publishers are trying to do are they're trying to contain the wide tail. They're trying to make wide tail experiences within their individual um, publishing units. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of what I think what publishers are doing to try to stop you from doing lots of long tail searches and just get you to the answer as quickly as possible within their, their ecosystem. So this is Google. Um, I'm, sure most, I'm sure at least 50% of you watch Game of Thrones. And for those of you who have not right, watched a recent episode, I will not reveal what happened, it's just everyone knows. Um, but this is um, a Google search for Game of Thrones. Now, we think of Google as a search engine, but look what Google's actually doing. This is news. This over here are images. This is social media from Google Plus over there. And over here, one fourth of the page is actually search. So what they've done is they've aggregated a bunch of information for you. There's no need to have to do a subsequent search for Game of Thrones news. Game of Thrones images, Game of Thrones social media. It's all right here. So 
So you could say, in a way, they've sort of killed the long, the long tail of, the, of behavior. They've given you a wide snapshot. Here's another example. I'm going to see it. Does anyone know what site this is? No? Good guess. Because it's one of my What's that? No? It's a good guess, too. It's not Google or Bing. This is a client of mine for four years. They're no longer my client, so um, I still love them. It's One King's Lane. Does anyone know One King's Lane? Yeah, all right, all right. So One King's Lane is this, yeah, it's distinct, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a concept of curation. We've all heard about curation. Curation is the opposite of the long tail. Rather than letting you sort of explore gazillions and gazillions of, um, of search results, they have experts who just show you, here's some great things you should buy. Don't worry about the confusion of millions and millions of searches. Just use these. And actually, here's a current client of ours. So this one I can actually promote. Blecko. Has anyone heard of Blecko? Probably not many. OK, Ian's heard of them. Blecko, um, talking about the old Wayback Machine, this is the founder of DMOZ, if anyone remembers DMOZ, started Blecko. And what Blecko does is it's curated search. So this is, I got this yesterday when I um, tried to do a search. Rather than showing you the, trying to spider the entire universe of websites, they have human editors who go in and select the best websites and only show results from those. So again, they're, what they're trying to do is say, don't waste your time on the long tail. We'll do the work for you. We'll help you find your answer. And I think this is very um, appealing to people. As content grows, um, you don't want to have that sort of over overwhelming experience. Another example where a publisher is trying to stop you from doing further searches is, is Amazon. And Amazon is sort of famous for this. And this is called collaborative filtering. People who bought this also bought this. Um, they're also doing bundling, where they're saying, oh, well, hey, if, if stop searching. Just buy these other things, because people, people who like you have liked these things. Another example, I, I will say that I think Twitter has about the worst user interface known to mankind. And, and the fact that they are a successful company is it's almost like despite themselves, I, I would say. I mean, the interface is terrible. No one uses Twitter, the, the interface, right? You all have a tool that you use. But what Twitter has done, to their mild credit, is they are trying to, at least on your homepage, create some mechanisms for you not to have to do lots of searches on Twitter. They have curation up here. Here's what we think you'll like. And it's based probably on collaborative filtering. People like you like this. And then they have, have a ranking mechanism that shows you the most popular searches. So on social media, if there was no ranking mechanism, you would be overwhelmed. And you would stop using that channel. Uh, because and you need to know what the trends are so that you can engage with other people. Otherwise, you'll be tweeting in the dark to people who are not paying attention. This is a better example, what I would, I would describe as a presentation layer. Taking data, this is Hootsuite. I guess who is the sponsor, it turns out, of this conference. So not, that was not intended, but go Hootsuite. Um, um, applying a presentation layer to make life easier in using the long tail, and really to enable you to manage many search, so, social media sites at once, a really a wide tail approach, going, getting, getting a snapshot of data rather than looking at deep, deep data. Facebook also does a lot with um, trying to curate your experience. So, Facebook has this concept called edge rank. Um, what edge rank does is it determines what is going to be most relevant to you in your social feed. So um, if there was no edge rank, every time one of your friends liked a photo or you know, joined a, you know, bought some gold coins on Farmville, it would show up in your feed. It would become overwhelming. It would be uninteresting. So the way that Facebook has encountered that is to build its algorithm to try to predict what is going to be most relevant to you. And Google, by the way, does the same thing. So here's two examples from Google. One is, uh, on the right, is incognito mode on Chrome. So there's no personalization. On the left is personalization. And you can see I typed in, um, I think I typed in PPC blog. And I was very excited to find that my company, PPC Associates, was in the top 10 on Google until I realized I was searching with personalization on. And when you search without personalization on, now you've got I'm not in the top 10. So um, the idea here, though, is to find you faster results, uh, find you better results, and so that you don't have to do lots of searching, you'll feel more relevant. Um, Google also does a lot of things which I call forcing mechanisms. Um, 
what they do is I typed in, um, hard to see here, but I typed in Pizza Hut on the top here, and Google automatically read my IP address and served me a map to my local Pizza Hut, um, and the results here showed my local Pizza Hut. So um, similarly, we sh someone showed this earlier, the um, uh, instant search, which is great from a user perspective, but if you think about it, it actually starts to steer you towards fewer and fewer queries. It gives you an answer so that you are, you're, you're doing actually, you're, there's actually more concentration on fewer searches. And then on the right here, I typed in uh, wedding invitations, and you see this thing here, which is product listing ads. This is um, trying to show you um, results um, without having to sort of look at another person's site until you're ready. Now, now the other thing I'll add about this is that from a marketing perspective, and this is kind of, this is gonna be a little too inside baseball, so I'm not gonna sort of share it today, but what Google has done in paid search is they really have eliminated the long tail in a lot of ways. And they do that through all these mechanisms. They do that through instant search, which reduces the n number of unique queries. They do that through geo-matching, which um, even if I didn't type in San Mateo, if I just type in mortgage rates, I still get ads for San Mateo. They do that through correcting misspellings. They do that through this broad match algorithm that matches you on lots of different queries. Um, so, so actually, when it comes to the paid search side of things, Google has really done a, a very good job of reducing the number of queries that are searched on, which makes them more money per query. Totally separate presentation. So the conclusion that I come to is the long tail is still certainly growing, and I'm not saying um, to, uh, I'm glad I didn't say the long tail is dead to, to avoid Ian's wrath. Um, and consumers are still, consumers are actually sort of more interested these days because of the plethora of different sources, um, devices, et cetera. They're actually a adopting more of a wedge tail approach Marketers have to follow consumers as they go across many, many different devices and channels. Um, and publishers are trying to create a, a wide tail experience on their site. They're, they're, they're still trying to avoid the, the long tail, but they're trying to create a wide tail experience within their site so that you don't go somewhere else for your wide tail shopping. Um, and that's the theoretical wide tail, long tail dis distinction. Thank you.